Hey, hey, hey! Welcome everybody to another live stream. Good to see everyone again once you guys get here. But uh, yeah, it's been a busy past couple days for me. So I've missed you guys the past three days. Um, I know I said I was gonna try to stream Sunday. Ended up taking the night off, and then yesterday I ended up I, just, I ended up deciding I just needed one more day off to rest. So we're back at it again tonight. Tonight we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so I was able to book the airplane with my flight school tomorrow morning from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. and I'm planning on flying from Miami exec down to Marathon and back so what we're gonna do today is go through the flight planning process a little bit here live so you guys can know what I'm looking for and what's going on through my head when I'm looking at this stuff I'm not gonna go totally in, in depth I'm not gonna show you how to plot the course and uh, wind correction angles and compensating for variation, deviation, stuff like that. I'm not going to get down to the nitty gritty, just some basic stuff, um, mainly covering weather and things like that, things I'm looking for to before I make my go, no go decision. Um, I did book the airplane for last Wednesday and did have to cancel due to weather. Um, it ended up being a nice day actually, but uh, like they say, better to be on the ground wishing you're in the air than being in the air wishing you're on the ground. So welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to do this a little bit of flight planning from for Miami Exec to Marathon, and then if we have time, which we should, we're going to do the flight on VATSIM, and I think Miami Approach is online right now, so that's perfect. We'll be able to pick up flight following on our way out of here. So let's jump right into this. Uh, let's get some music going first. Need some good music while you're doing flight planning. And let's see if I can get this all working the way I want it to. Alright, so the first thing I like to do, or... Yeah, first thing I like to do is pull up Sky Vector. Um, sometimes I'll just do this straight away on Garmin Pilot on my iPad. Since I have you guys with me, I'll do it here on the computer, on the desktop. So you can go to skyvector.com. You guys see me use this a lot when we do our briefings and stuff like that. 
Um, you have the different options up here. Obviously we're doing World VFR because we're flying VFR, so we want the VFR sectional there in the back. If you're flying IFR or something like that, you could switch this to you know, the low IFR routes, high IFR routes, there's different maps here. You can even do the Miami TAC chart, which we'll go into that soon here as well. But we're going to start off with the World VFR chart. So we're down here in South Florida, where I'm at right now in Miami, a little bit south of downtown. So we're going to be flying Miami Executive, this airport here, down to Marathon, Florida in the Keys. So straight away what I'll do is I'll pull up this little flight plan uh, button here. We'll plug in KTMB, KMTA8, TH. That'll draw us the line straight there. If you want, you can put in speed and altitude. I don't really use this here in Sky Vector, but just for fun, we'll do it. I was planning to keep this flight nice and low so we can get some pretty views out our windows of the Florida Keys. I'm not planning to go any higher than 2,500 for this trip. Um, we are going to pick up flight following so we should have uh, traffic advisories from Miami Approach all the way down into Marathon. Alright, so first what I like to do is plan out my route, of course, right? How are we going to get there? So I was planning to depart out to the east. Let me see what's chiming in here real quick. Is that V-Pilot? Yeah, V-Pilot. Okay. Nothing to worry about there. Alright, so... We want a pretty view of the water and going down the Florida Keys. So we're going to depart out to the east initially here, out of Miami Executive. So what I'll do is I'll drag this line over here to the coastline. Actually, I'll probably ask them for a southeast departure. We'll head up down this way over Perrine, which is where I'm located here at my house. I might even be able to see my house flying over in this direction. So we'll plot that point there. And we're going to, after we clear the coastline, we're going to head out over here to where you see these little islands here. Let's go to the Miami TAC chart since it's a little bit more detailed. This is the terminal area chart, I think they call it. It's a little more zoomed in than the sectional, so you get a little bit more uh, detail, like this chicken key here. That's something you didn't see on the sectional. If I go back to World VFR, you don't see chicken key anywhere there. If we go to the Miami TAC chart, We've got it there. So we're going to head southeast bound over the coastline. We'll be looking for a chicken key there and passing Cutler Bay, Palmetto Bay, which is my area. We'll head out here over the coastline. After we clear the coast in Chicken Key, we'll make a, a turn to the right, maybe uh, 130 or so, and head over to these islands here. And basically what we're going to do is follow the Florida Keys all the way down to Marathon. So I'll just keep plotting a couple more points here. We'll join up here with the keys, and then we're just going to continue to follow it down. I like to put my next point maybe right here, where US-1 meets up with card sound. So this... oh, it's a little bit further down than that. Down here. This is where US-1, one of the main highways here in South Florida, goes all the way down. It runs all the way down to Key West. Once it gets over into the Keys here, it meets up with this uh, card sound road. So that'll be another spot for us to look for. Really easy flight, like I said. Uh, normally, if I'm flying in an area that I'm unfamiliar with and I'm looking for things that I've never seen before in my life, I'm going to be doing this on an actual sectional, paper sectional, and, uh, and calculating exact headings and magnetic headings and whatnot to fly. Since I'm familiar with this area, I know the Florida Keys. It's a pretty much uh, it's pretty much straightforward. We're just following the only uh, only line of islands down here, South Florida. There's nothing really to look for or search for. So I'm not going to go super in depth there, calculating our the perfect magnetic heading to follow. Once we see the islands, we're just following that all the way down. So we don't really need that. So I'll plot my next point there. Let's jump back over to the sectional so we can get down further south. I'll maybe plot another one down here somewhere by Isla Mirada, Holiday Isle. As a kid, I used to come down here a lot with my family. We'd go to the beach there at Holiday Isle. I'd do some bridge fishing with my dad here. We used to have a great time. And then finally into Marathon down here. Okay, and then we'll, next thing I like to do once we have the route here is look for any special use airspace or any any uh, airspace that we might need to look out for. Hermit Crab, hey, what's going on? 
Glad to join live stream again. Are you going to fly in the Cessna? Yes, we will fly in the Cessna, Hermit Crab. Welcome back. And good to see you. I hope your day's going well. As soon as we're done here talking about our route and going over the weather, we're going to jump in the airplane and actually do the flight. Here in the simulator in the Cessna, tomorrow I'll be doing this flight in real life in a Cessna 172. So that's what I'm here practicing for. This is kind of review for me. It's been two months since I've been up though, so it's a good review, good refresher, and uh, better to figure stuff out now on the ground than in the air. So we've got our route plotted here. We'll jump back up here to Tamiami. Tamiami is a class Delta airport, so we'll be talking to Tower on our way out of here. We are located underneath Miami International's uh, class Bravo airspace. So that's the first thing that we're going to have to be careful of when heading out of Tamiami. Over here over the airport, the Bravo shelf starts at uh, 5,000 feet. We won't be anywhere near there. And then once we clear this blue line here heading out over the shoreline, the Bravo starts at 3,000. So inside each of these pieces of the blue pie here, you're going to see what looks like a, a fraction here, right? 70 over 30. So 30 is where is 3,000. Where the Bravo starts at 3,000 feet is the bottom and 7,000 feet is the top. So we're going to want to stay below 3,000 feet out over here over the coastline. So like I said earlier, we're just going to do 2,500 feet for the entire flight just to keep it low and see see the keys and stuff. I don't want to get too high. You can't really see much up there. So we're going to keep it nice and low. 2,500 feet will keep us underneath Miami's class Bravo until we clear it out here. If we want to go higher, we could. I'm just going to keep it at 2,500. So 2,500 feet out over the coast. Then we're going to head one, heading 130 approximately until we meet up with the Keys. Once we have visual on the Keys, we'll just follow the islands down this way. Now there is Homestead's Air Reserve Base, which is also a class Delta, but there is no civilian traffic allowed to land there. I think you can contact the tower and transition to the airspace if you wanted to. We're just going to go around it. Um, back when I, back about 20 years ago when I first started flying, they actually used to allow you to do touch and goes and stuff there. But ever since 9-11, they, they don't let you do that stuff anymore. So we're going to stay outside of their class Delta and come out this way and then follow the islands down. We've got Ocean Reef Club, which is a private strip there. I don't remember the name of this exact key. I guess you could just call it Ocean Reef. We're going to already be at 2,500 before we reach there. Um, it's pretty much at sea level. Uh, six feet is the elevation. A thousand six feet would be pattern altitude. We're going to be well above, so we can just overfly Ocean Reef Club. And if we want, we can monitor their sea taf 122.7 if we want to be extra vigilant and hear any airplanes that are in the area. We'll overfly that 2,500. We're going to just continue following the keys. Pretty much straightforward, going down this way. No other, no other airspace to be worried about down here all the way down into Marathon. Marathon is a class golf airport. And then this magenta ring you see here is class Echo, which starts at 700 feet above the surface and goes up to um, yeah, all the way up. I think it goes up to flight level 180. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> class Echo is the most confusing one to me because uh, there's so many variants but let's call it 700 feet up will be Class Echo. Uh, Class Golf, the, this is an uncontrolled airport. We won't be talking to Tower or anybody like that. But there is a CTAF, Common Traffic Advisory Frequency 122.95, which we'll use to announce our position and intentions into, into Marathon. They also have an ASOS, which is an automated weather system. Um, and the SIM here, we won't be able to pick it up since I'm on that SIM and they won't have an ASOS for Marathon, but in real life tomorrow, we will tune to this when we're about 25, 30 miles out and pick up the weather before we head in. Um, if for whatever reason we had to continue south, so let's say some storms built up behind us. Uh, up here up north, I turn, ar I turn around and it looks black out there and I'm not going to make it. I'm going to most likely hang out here at Marathon. Um, if something happens at Marathon for whatever reason and we're already southbound, there's stuff going on behind us, an alternate would be Key West International, which is a class Delta. If we do head down to Key West, there's only one restricted uh, airspace here that we have to worry about. And then there's also this Key West Nas Boca Chica field, which is, uh, I think it's also military. I don't think they allow civilian traffic. So just 
just to be aware of that. And then the only restricted is this blue area here, which you can see here is unmarked balloon on a cable to 4,000 feet, uh, 14,000 feet MSL. It's basically a weather balloon that's on a cable that goes all the way up to 14,000. So that's it for special use airspace. We've got one restricted and nothing else up here, just the Bravo to look out for and a couple of deltas to stay out, out of. There's the alert area out here over to the west uh, for con concentrated flight training. You're allowed to fly in and out of there. You just got to watch out for airplanes because there's a bunch of airplanes in there doing flight training. All right, so we've got all that squared away. Anything else I want to touch on here before we leave? Um, there's this Ada's line here. Obviously, we're not going that far out over the water. So we don't have to worry about crossing that. You cannot cross that without a DVFR flight plan and without talking to customs and whatnot. If we did happen to fly outside of that line and come back in or something like that, we'd most likely be met up with some F six F-16s outside our, our airplane and they're going to want to fly us down and have a chat with us. So we don't want to do that, but that's far away. That's nothing that we have to worry about for this flight. Um, was there one more thing I wanted to say? Yeah, we'll be over the keys the entire time. No need for life rafts or anything like that. It's only it's usually recommended if you're flying, I think it's 50 nautical miles out over the shoreline. We're going to be over land the entire way. Um, all right, let's talk about ditching and stuff like that. So this is something I like to think about too. If we do happen to lose an engine or something like that, uh, where are we going to land, right? So once we depart out of Tamiami going out east this way, this is the area I'm most concerned about. It's highly congested here in Miami. A lot of buildings, a lot of houses, trees, you name it. All the roads you can guarantee are going to be packed with cars. You've got power lines, trees, narrow ways. Not a whole lot of places to land here. If we go back to the Miami tech chart and zoom in, which gives us a little bit more detail. There's a lake out here. Um, once we're on climb out, we're climbing out this way up to 2,500. Once we're above 500 or so, in between 500 and 2,500, if we lose an engine on climb out, we can turn back. Once we get out a little further east, and that does not, that's no longer an option, we've got the Don Chula Expressway, which again, might have a ton of cars on it. But that might be our best option if we get stuck out here somewhere. Or we can ditch in this little lake right here, would be another option. Once we kind of pass that and clear that and get out over here, obviously the obvious choice if there's no roads available is going to be to ditch out in the water, which, I mean, honestly I'm more comfortable doing that than having to pick a spot in this area. So once we get out over the water, it's kind of like, okay, if anything happens, we've got a place to put it down where we're not hurting anybody or damaging any property. And that's pretty much how it'll be all the way down to the Keys. Keys are just main, mainly one road, US-1. You might be able to find a hole there where there's not cars and land on it, which would be something I would try to attempt to do. But once I get start to get low, if I do spot a lot of cars on the road, then I'm just going to veer off and ditch in the water. All right, I think that covers everything as far as the route goes and any emergencies and alternates if we need them. Um, yeah, there's a couple smaller little private fields here too if we lost an engine or something and we're not going that far, but... They're there if we need them, even Ocean Reef. If we lost an engine out over here somewhere, we can't make it to Homestead Air Force Base. We can, we can land it there at Ocean Reef. All right, so next thing we want to talk about is weather. <coughs> I know a lot of you guys will be kind of bored with all this stuff, so sorry. And those of you who are sticking around, I appreciate your patience. Before we get to the actual flying part, so let's jump over to weather. So weather, a uh, great source of weather for aviation is aviationweather.gov. This is the Aviation Weather Center, NOAA National Weather Service. So this is all legit, legit. Um, great source, great source for weather. So first thing, let's go in, let's zoom in a little bit here and let's take a look at the current weather observations for these airports that we're flying at. So we'll go to observations, we're in the METAR section. And we'll just read what the weather is now. I'll hover my mouse over here. And here you have the current METAR at Tamiami. This is for right now, tonight. So 27th of the month, 2353 Zulu, winds are 080 at 10. 
10 knots, uh, 10 statue mile of visibility, few clouds, 4,400, temp 25, dew point 15, altimeter 3006. Couple remarks here, uh, rain began at 11 past the hour and ending 20 minutes past the hour. And this other stuff, sea level pressure stuff, we don't really need, that doesn't really pertain to us flying VFR. So there's the current weather for Tamiami. And we can jump down here and grab the current weather for Marathon as well. Their METAR. Uh, Marathon, 27th of the month, 2353 Zulu. This is an automated system. This is not something that you know somebody there in the control tower did or inputted. This is a basically a little uh, weather tower there at the airport that picks up this different information. Wind 070 at 10, 10 statue mile visibility, few clouds, 3,500, temp 26, dew point 18, altimeter 3002. And that's it. So weather's looking nice. If I were to fly right now, not much wind, nice and high ceilings, I'd make this flight no problem, going based off the METARs for both airport. Since we are not flying right now, in real life, we'll be flying tomorrow morning. We're going to want to look at the TAFs. So we'll go over to Forecast, and we'll go to TAFs. And basically what TAFs is, it gives you uh, basically three different METARs. One for the... Uh, I think they last for like 12 hours or something like that. Maybe 24 hours. We'll go over it now here in detail for Tamiami. So this one is uh, from the 28th, 00 Zulu, 28th, 2400 Zulu. So yeah, 24 hours. Over that 24 hour period, winds are going to be about 080 at 15. Um, visibility greater than 10 statue miles. A few clouds, 4000 scattered at 6. Then we jump into the next line. This is where the tasks kind of become in handy. This tells you here, it says from the 28th of the month at 05. Zulu, which is going to be about 1 a.m. local time here, so overnight. From uh, 0 100 local time on the 28th, winds will be 0 8 0 at 6. Greater than 6 statue mile visibility, few clouds, 3,500, scattered at 1 5,000. And then if we jump down the next line, this is from the 28th, 1,500 Zulu, so that's going to be. Uh, yeah. Need a calculator. My math is terrible, so 15 minus 4 is going to give us 1100 local time. So this would actually pertain to my flight tomorrow. Uh, we'll actually be finishing the flight probably just before this information here becomes current. So winds will be 100 at 15, greater than 6 statue miles, few clouds, 30, 3500 scattered at 15. So looking at both of these uh, rows here, which is going to be my flight's going to take place right in, be in between the, bo the both. We've got good visibility here. We've got nice and high ceilings. Actually, not even a true ceiling. These are few and scattered layers, so it's going to be plenty of blue sky. And the winds shouldn't be. They should be between 6 and 15 knots from the east. Nothing to worry about there. All of that looks good. Let's jump down to Marathon. I'm not sure if Marathon will have a TAF. They might. They don't. So they just have their METAR there. Um, we can go down to Key West, and they don't have one either. Okay, so we'll just go based off that for now. My decision at this point, after all the stuff we've already reviewed, would be to go. This, is, this flight's looking good so far. Next thing we can do, we can go to Forecast. Um, let's go to the Prog Charts. So I like to look at these two down here. So this is the 12 hour prog chart and this is a 24 hour prog chart. So 12 hours from now will be 8 a.m. which is when I'm planning to depart tomorrow. So this is what we'll be looking at here for the 12 hour. Now this is just going to show you what the visibility is whether it's VFR, moder uh, marginal VFR, IFR and also shows you some turbulence information here. So this little blue cloud looking thing here. anything. Inside of this blue cloud is going to be marginal VFR. You can look down here at the legend or the key, whatever you want to call it. So all this stuff in this area here, all anything inside this cloud area in here is going to be marginal VFR. Anything outside of it is going to be full VFR. So ceilings above 3,000, visibility over, is it three statue miles? Um, 
yeah, so we're down here in South Florida. We're going to be all VFR. Nothing to worry about there. Like I said, inside here is marginal. And then if you go into the red, this stuff is all IFR. And of course, you need to be instrument rated if you're going to be flying in or out of IFR. So it kind of paints the picture for you there across the US. All this stuff here is going to be bad weather down in here. All the stuff outside of the blue cloud is going to be VFR weather. We've got a little VFR section in here, but then again, some marginal stuff in here if you're out uh, Arizona, this area. Um, the, the orange lines is moderate or greater turbulence. Again, nothing down here where we're at. We're looking wide open here for the 12 hour. And if we're curious about the 12 hour as well, I mean the 24 hour, you can look over here and see how things change from one chart to the next. So a lot of this stuff that's here is moving to the east. You can see it starts to cover Tennessee over here. So if, say if I was flying VFR in East Tennessee, I might look at this and decide, yeah, I'm going to fly in the morning, but if I was going to be flying at night, it's going to be marginal, and I might have to think, I might have to plan for another day at that point. So according to the prog charts, we're looking good here. Andy Dotson, what's going on? Vatson tonight? Yes, we'll be starting our flight in about 15 minutes or so. Right now I'm just briefing, uh, we're just doing flight planning and briefing stuff for this flight from Miami Exec to Marathon because I'll be doing this in real life tomorrow. So this is kind of a practice for me and I'm also uh, just planning, planning ahead and doing stuff that I want to get done now that I won't have to wake up super early and do it again tomorrow morning. So I'm kind of just briefing the weather in our route and stuff like that and then we will do the flight in that sim and then we're going to do it in real life tomorrow. I'll be taking the GoPros with me, so I'll be taking you guys along on that flight. I probably won't be able to upload it until sometime next week because it takes time to, to edit and stuff like that. But you guys, guys will see a video, and then later we can kind of compare the simulator with what happened in real life and maybe debrief once I upload. Alright, so next thing I'd like to look at, we can go back to forecast. We went over the prog charts, the TAFs, um, the stuff. Not really icing, we don't really have to deal with here in Florida. Um, we're not going up high for one, and then it's super hot down here at 2,500 feet. I don't even need to check the icing. If you live up north or in the mountains or something, this is something you want to look at. Um, there's currently no icing sigmets, but you can see here up high there's forecasted icing at some point. I'm not going to go through that right now. Convection, this is something we do deal with in South Florida a lot in the summer. Um, Right now, as you can see here over here in this box, it says no convective sigmet active at the moment. So nothing going on there. Um, you can see here, it's got, they've got the different outlooks and stuff like that, it's forecasted stuff. We're looking good for tomorrow. Nothing to worry about there for right now. Things can always change. I could wake up tomorrow and weather could be totally different. All the stuff is forecasted. Uh, we can try to paint the picture the best we can in our head the night before, but tomorrow it's what we see with our eyes looking out the window and heading to the airport, and we can make our final call then when we're about to head out to the airplane. All right, I think I covered just about everything I wanted to. Okay, winds and temps, so you can get the winds uh, aloft data. If I was going higher, this is something you want to look at. We're staying at 2,500 feet, so it's really just kind of surface winds and what the METAR shows. But say I was going to cruise at 4,500 feet today, I would want my winds aloft data. I'd go here to winds, I'd select this section here, and we're going to have a few stations. We have Key West and Miami, these are the two that I would look at if I was going any higher for this flight. Um, you're going to want to look at the time frame that it's active for. So for tomorrow, for my flight, it would be this one here, um, the 28th from 12 Zulu to midnight Zulu, so that's going to be... Uh, let's see, 12 minus 4, 12 minus 4, 8 a.m. So yeah, this would be, this would be um, for use when I take off at 8 a.m. and last throughout my flight. So this is the one I'd be, the numbers I would want to be looking at. The first one I'm going to go to is Miami. Um, if we're choosing 4,500 feet to cruise at, we're going to have to do some interpolation since they only show these set numbers altitudes here. So 3,000 and 6,000. If we were cruising at 4,500, we'd be somewhere in between. So what you'd have to do is add the two numbers of the two and then divide it by two to get the average number. Um, we can look at the numbers right now for 3,000, so it'll be at 2,500. 
Um, there is hardly any temperature difference from the surface, so that's why they don't include the temperature for the first number here. But as you get higher, they include the temperature as well. So the first set of numbers, the first four, is your wind direction and wind speed. And then after the plus or minus sign is your temps. <clears throat> Steven Hayes, what's going on? Hey, nice you're able to get the plane booked again. Hope the weather doesn't crap on you again. Yes, hoping for the best, Steven. Um, I think the winds might pick up a little bit in the afternoon, but so far it's looking good. Uh, we just reviewed the tafts and the winds are gonna be between six and 15 knots tomorrow. And it's gonna be pretty much straight down the runway, both here at Miami and at Marathon. So nothing to worry about with the winds right now. I do know in the afternoon they're supposed to pick up a little bit. I uh, was a little bit worried about rain showers and stuff like that. There was some stuff forecasted earlier. Um, I think a lot of that's actually cleared up and it's going to it's gonna end up being a nice day. So, so far so good. We're wrapping up this weather brief now and then we're going to jump in the airplane in the sim and do it. So looking at Miami, 3,000 feet. Um... Okay, so it's the first two numbers is the wind direction, second is the wind speed. So you just take the two first numbers, one one, so it's one one zero are the winds. So winds are coming from one one zero at ten knots at three thousand. If we were to go up to six thousand, winds would be one two zero at twelve knots. And it's fourteen degrees Celsius up there, and then gets lower as you get higher. If for whatever reason you did want to calculate the temperature at 3000, you could. You can use the standard wraps, uh, lapse rate, which we use. It's uh, 2 degrees per 1000 feet of altitude. So say the temperature, let's use 15 degrees. It's 15 degrees down here at the surface in Miami. If you climb up to 1000 feet, um, the temperature would be 13. Temperature would be, no, I'm sorry, it would be, yeah, 13 degrees Celsius. If you went up another 1,000 feet to um, 2,000 feet, it would be 11 degrees Celsius and so on. So it goes down 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet, if you so happen to want to figure that out. Um, that's it. That's it for the winds aloft data. We're not going to be needing that for tomorrow. We're staying nice and low. Uh, so we went over our route, we went over our own weather stuff. Last thing I would do is go to Lidos Flight Service, 1-800-WeatherBrief.com. Log into your account. If you have not created an account, you'll need to create one. But here you can file your flight plan and you can get a an actual weather briefing from the flight service station. So you go up here, plan and brief at the top. Log into my account. Again, plan and brief at the top here. There it goes. All right, so here's where you would put your flight plan information in. It's on the ICAO format. Uh, tomorrow, aircraft ID is 172 Lima November. That is the airplane I'll be flying. We're gonna be flying VFR. This will be a general general flight, flight type. So you got military, other, general aviation, et cetera, et cetera. So G, number of aircraft one, we're gonna be in a Cesta 172. Wake turbulence, low, our airplane doesn't really deal with it too well, so low would be for that one. Uh, equipment, I have S in there right now, let me see. I would actually go, this would be better. We'd be slant G, really. So I'm gonna change that to G, departure, we're gonna be out of Tamiami, Miami Executive, we're going, we're gonna be departing tomorrow. 0800, Eastern Daylight Time, Cruising speed, let's put in 100 knots. And cruise level, we're just gonna stay low at 2,500. This is gonna be VFR, we don't really need to plug in any of this stuff here. Our destination is gonna be Marathon. Elapsed time, it's gonna be about a little bit under an hour in the air. Let's put 55 minutes. So you gotta use the right format or it won't take it. 0055, alternate, optional, we can put in Key West if we want. Uh, fuel endurance, we're gonna have four to five hours on board, plenty of fuel. We're gonna top off our tanks before we head down. 
So we'll have enough to go back and forth several times, plus reserves if we had to, I don't know, shoot to the west coast of Florida or whatever. Persons on board, it's going to be me by myself. The airplane, etc., etc. And we'll just hit route brief. So this will be an official official weather briefing. You can also call them 1-800-WX-BRIEF on the phone and have an actual briefer uh, explain this stuff to you. That's, I highly recommend doing that if you're new. If you're just starting off flying, I mean, that's a, a guy who's a professional at dealing with weather. He'll be able to talk, walk you through everything and explain if the weather's going to be good enough for you to fly or not. So I'm going to pick up the text version here. We're going to do a standard briefing. You can pick up three different types. There's the standard abbreviated outlook. Standard briefing is kind of like your whole briefing. I mean, everything from start to finish. Um, outlook briefing is a briefing if actually a lot of the data we're going to pull now is going to be an outlook briefing since our flight takes place over six hours away from this point now and that's what's referred to as an outlook briefing an outlook briefing is a briefing that your flight time is over six hours away so it's kind of like you can't really you can use it to kind of uh, paint the general picture in your head but it's not going to be current weather information it's good if you do pick up an outlook briefing like tomorrow morning i'll probably call the service station or i'll just do this again and pick up the standard once again or maybe an abbreviated abbreviated briefing would be say i pulled up the standard briefing tonight and then tomorrow i just wanted to check a few things and not really have the entire list of stuff read out to me you could do an abbreviated briefing and they'll just go over like the standard the main stuff visibility um winds notum stuff like that all right, so then you have different op options here that you can select. I'm not going to go through all of them. We're just going to click PDF briefing down here, and it's going to generate that. Eight people here in the chat. I can't believe you guys are actually liking this. Good. I'm happy because I didn't think anybody would stick around for this stuff. Um, let's see. It opened it in a new window. Let's see if I can pull it up in this window here. So that you guys can see, is that coming up? All right, yeah, awesome. So here it is, a whole, it's probably, this is all briefing information regarding our flight tomorrow. Now you don't have to read all this word for word. You're not really expected to. There's some nitty gritty stuff if you really wanna go into detail and there's something that you're looking for, you could probably find it in here. But of course, we're not gonna go through 61 pages of inf information. We're just going to go through the main stuff here. This is all the stuff we plugged in. Um, our aircraft, our speed, the route, whatever. All, all the stuff we picked as far as the options to, to customize the briefing. You've got a table of contents here. Contents here. Adverse conditions. you got TFRs, NOTAMs, AIRMEDS, SIGMEDS going down. you got your weather synops synopsis, current weather, forecasted weather, your NOTAMs. Moving down here. All right, so starting with the TFRs. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to explain when we were looking at the at Sky Vector. So we'll go back to that right now. TFRs, there is a couple of them in the area. They're not active right now. They won't be active for another few days, but let's go and jump back to those real quick. TFR, so that's these orange and red circles that you pop that you see popping up here. Orange means that it's not active yet, but it'll be active soon. Uh, this particular one down here will be live in 31 days. This one here in 9 days. These are aerial demonstration TFRs. There's an air show coming up in Fort Lauderdale next weekend. Um, so that's what that's for there. That's not active for another 9 days. I'll be from the surface up to 1-5,000. So you will not be allowed to fly VFR through this TFR in 9 days. And then you got one down here in Miami. Also an air show. It's the same one, I think. They do it up here, and then a few weeks later, they do it down here in Miami. I am planning to go to the one in Fort Lauderdale next weekend. Um, I don't think it's this weekend. It might be the following weekend. I'm going to go to this one. I don't think I'm going to go to the one in Miami, because that's on Memorial Day weekend, and the beach gets insanely packed on Memorial Day weekend. It's crowded. It's dangerous. I don't like to be out there in those big holidays, but I'm probably going to go to this one. Um, if it was active, you would see it in red. Like if we jump up here to Orlando. This is a permanent, TF, permanent TFR over Walt Disney World. That's why it's red. You're never allowed to fly within this circle from the surface up to 3,000 feet AGL ever. If you do, you'll get in big trouble. And that's what TFRs are. Temporary flight uh, restrictions. The one in Disney World's permanent, but you get the idea. 
A lot of these will pop up, say, for air shows. If um, the president's flying into town, you'll see it over Miami. And you won't be allowed to fly VFR through them. If you are IFR and have a flight plan, you can. Alright, so TFRs, those are the ones that we have. They're not active for another several days, so they don't really pertain to us. But it will let you know here in the briefing. TFR starts 60 plus minutes after estimated time to leave the area. So those are the TFRs. The closed unsafe notums we've got um, here at Tamiami, Miami Executive, runway 1331's closed. So let's be aware of that. Um, no notums for Marathon down in the Key West. Runway 927, which is the only runway they have, is closed except for air carriers Monday through Friday. And that's overnight in the middle of the night. You can fly there during the daytime. Um, GA as a civilian, no problem. But overnight, they only allow air carriers to go in and out of Key West. So that's the notum for Key West, which is our alternate. Uh, no convective signets, no signets, no air mets. So that's all significant weather stuff like turbulence, icing, um, convective stuff. That would all show up here. Uh, freezing level charts. Not stuff that we that pertains to us on this flight here. Again, here's the synopsis in current weather. Um, good rule of thumb when looking at these charts here is high high pressure systems are usually associated with good weather, and low pressure system is usually bad weather. You can see here these lows, and you can see lots of rain and stuff in the area. Turbulence out here in the high pressure area. A lot of this stuff is clear, which is good for us down here in South Florida. This is going to keep some of this stuff away from us for a few days, and it should be nice tomorrow. Um, not going to go over that because I don't know too much about it. You've got some wind information there and some other stuff. There is a, it looks like a low pressure system down here. Over, um, over South America, that's still way down there. That's not really going to affect us for tomorrow morning or tonight. Then you've got your METARs and your TAFs that we already went over on Sky Vector, just all the weather information. So we can skip all that. You can see, you just look down here in the left column, or VFR all the way down. A lot of these airports are airports that are nearby, Opalaka, Hollywood. There's Marathon, Key West. All VFR for tomorrow and tonight. Uh, cloud coverage. Again, wide open, so there's going to be some scattered stuff tomorrow, but it should be mostly blue skies. Uh, visibility, surface winds, and precip. We're all we're looking good down here. Everything's looking good in South Florida so far. We can skip all that. Again, here's the TAFs. Everything looks green. High ceilings. A little bit of wind. It's supposed to get windy later on. Um, let's take a look at one of these here. Um, let's do... Yeah, let's look at... So, let's see. Um, so, for example, tomorrow, uh, April 28th, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so 8 p.m. local time. We'll be well done with our flight by then, but as you can see later on, the wind does pick up. 08013 with gust to 22. Still heading right down the runway. I would still fly in this, actually. A little bit gustier than I'd like, but that's better better than a consistent 22 knot winds. 13 with some gusts to 22, and it's heading straight down the runway, so not like a, a huge crosswind situation deal there. So not a deal breaker for me. Here's some winds aloft data that we already went over. Um, area forecast, just some general information about this entire area. A lot of this stuff deals with the lower Caribbean down here. We don't really need to read all this word for word. Tomorrow should be nice in South Florida. Uh, skipping down, convective outlooks, no convective down here. We'll be pre-flighting our airplane about five minutes, guys. Not too much longer. This is the last thing we're doing, I promise. Stuff I kind of have to do for tomorrow anyways. Uh, 
notums down here. Yeah, so these are all the notums. Um, these here are just uh, obstructions. There's lots of cranes and stuff around Tamiami. So a lot of them only go up to maybe two, 200 feet at most. There is one big one down by Homestead over here that goes up to 1,800 feet MSL. Everybody who flies in South Florida in this area, we're well aware of that tower. We're going to be flying out this way, so we don't need to really worry about that. Unless on the way back we want to go this way instead of over the keys, so we just got to be mindful of that. There's the one tower there goes up to 1,800 feet. The rest of them are between 100 and maybe 250 feet max, nothing that we have to worry about. So that's all of these. You can see the elevations here in the red. Cranes, buildings, and such. Uh, down here, runway notums. Runway 13, end light, unserviceable. 13 and 31 is closed anyways. As stated here, don't have to worry about that. Taxiway closures. Uh, we'll hear that on the ATIS tomorrow. And also, taxiway hotel, hotel 2, hotel 3, that's all on the south side of the airport. So it shouldn't affect us either, but we've got the we've got ground charts available as well as Garmin Pilot. Um, FDC notams. These are all the active approaches in the area for Miami Executive, maybe Marathon. Nothing that we need to look at there really. Destination notams, same thing. You've got obstructions, a couple hundred feet in the air. That about covers it. Let's just scroll through here and see if there's anything that jumps out at me. So based on everything we've looked over so far, I'm definitely going to fly tomorrow. Weather's looking good. And like I said, that could all change as well. So tomorrow morning I'll probably pick up an abbreviated briefing or come back here and pull up another standard and run through it all again myself. And of course, I'll look out the window and go outside myself and take a look with my own eyes, which is going to be your best, uh, the best way to judge the weather that's all around you, right? Instead of a computer telling me what's happening, you could look outside and kind of get a general idea. Um, if the weather does end up bad tomorrow and we have to cancel going down to the marathon, which could always be a possibility, we could... I have a couple sec sec uh, second options. We can kind of stay in the area and go up the beach. Jumping back over here. Instead of going down this way, where if there's weather build up on either side, we could be stuck here in the Keys. There's not many options. We can't go right and break off this way. We can't go left and break off this way. It's either turn back or land at Marathon or the, or the Key West and sit there. But if weather is looking bad out here, it's scatter, it's kind of sketchy, questionable stuff, we'll depart out of Tamiami, we'll just head out over the beach, and I'll give you guys a nice tour of Miami Beach. Maybe we'll run into going to Opalaka, do a few touch and goes, and then head back this way. That would be plan B. Plan C, if it's really bad and the weather's... I don't want to go too far from Tamiami, then touch and goes. I would like to at least get in a couple touch and goes tomorrow, being that it's been two months since I have flown. All right, guys, I think I'm done boring you with all of this stuff. <laughs> if you stuck around this far, congratulations, you guys. You guys want to know what's up, and that's good. Drones. There is one drone. Uh, note them here. It's usually surface to 400, which is not something that we have to worry about, but just to keep in mind. And that is it, guys. All right, let's jump into the airplane. Let's see who's online. Okay, I was hoping Miami Center would have hopped online by now, and they're not, and Miami Approach signed off. So it looks like we won't be able to get flight following down. We might be on our own for this flight in the simulator. But it is what it is. All right, into the airplane. All right, let me catch up on some messages here. Da, 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 da. Um, Vatsim tonight. Ask Andy. Yes, Vatsim. Steven said, nice to get the plane. Yes. Mr. Newbie. Yes, it's very informative. Thank you, Mr. Newbie. Glad you're sticking around. Welcome, sir. Don, what's going on, Don? I'm doing great, man. How you doing? You're going to video your flight tomorrow? Yes, I will be bringing the GoPros and taking you guys along with me tomorrow. It's going to take me... 
few days or possibly a week to edit the video, but it will be up eventually. So yes, done. Definitely. Alright guys, um, I think we're already connected to VATSIM. Uh, V-Pilot, VATSIM, yep. Yeah. Yeah, Miami Approach did sign off. Yeah, so we're not going to have any t ATC for this flight, but that's fine. I'm still going to make the radio calls just to pretend. Just so I can not be so rusty tomorrow. Alright, so, walking out to the airplane. After I've grabbed the keys from my flight school, I'm approaching the airplane. We're already looking to see if there's anything funky going on. Anything weird or... Anything broken hanging off the airplane. Pre-flight starts when you're walking out to the airplane, not once you get to the walk-around portion. So I'm getting to the door now. Open her up. Let's jump inside and drop our stuff off. And let me set up Garmin Pilot here on my phone for you guys to see what it is I do and run through the checklist and stuff like that. sure this is working. Alright, let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Looks a little bit different today because usually I'm using my iPad for Garmin Pilot during our streams, but today I'm using my cell phone since this is what I normally use in the Cessna 172. There's not a whole lot of room in there. Lugging around a 10-inch iPad while you're flying is not ideal, so I use my phone kind of mounted over here to my left on the windshield with this suction cup mount that I use. So I'm using my phone and that's what you're seeing here. For Garmin Pilot, I've already plotted my route there. I don't know why it's not picking up our current location. It's picking up where I'm at here in real life. I might need to fix that. Or we could just skip it altogether. We just won't have the moving airplane on the map, which is good practice. These things can fail as well. Um, all right, so let's go to our checklist. We're going to be in the 172 Papa tomorrow. Um, I'm going to use that checklist. It's The that airplane's a little bit different from this one in that it's carbureted. This airplane and the sim is fuel injected, so there's going to be some differences here. But um, I'll point those out as we go along. <clears throat> All right, starting with the pre-flight, once we get inside the airplane here. So documents, arrow, we use that acronym arrow, that's airworthiness, we need to make sure we have all these documents on board. So it's the airworthiness uh, certificate, which should be, usually it's right here in this airplane, um, in some kind of document pouch here. The airworthiness, the registration, operator's manual, and weight and balance, we've got all those on board. Alright, control wheel lock, removed, magnetos are off, avionics is off, master switch is coming on. Fuel quantity, we're going to check. Um, they're topped off both sides. Flaps, we're going to bring those down. Lights, we'll test those. So we're going to get all of those on. As well as our pedo heat. And then we're going to go back outside. We're going to walk around and make sure all of our lights are working. So we've got our nav lights there. We've got the red and the blinking strobe around the tail section. We've got the rotating beacon, and this nav light, position light, is lit. That white one there, it doesn't look like it is, but it is. Over on this side, we've got our green nav, and as well as our strobe. And in the front, we've got our, our landing lights over here. So all our lights are working. I'll go and I'll tap the pitot tube as well, make sure that's hot and pitot heat's working. And then jump back in the airplane before we kill the battery. We'll get all of our lights and pedo heat back off. And turn off the master. Uh, fuel selector on both. And in this airplane, my airplane doesn't have it tomorrow, but this airplane has a fuel shutoff valve. We'll push that in. And then we'll begin our walk around the airplane. So starting here with the back end of the empionage. We're going to check our baggage door and make sure that's closed and locked. Here, let me jump over to the... Let's do drone view. This is going to be a little bit easier for me to show you guys. 
everything that I'm looking for. Baggage door is closed and locked, and I'm gonna run my hands along the sides of the side of the empionage here, just looking for any dents or any panels that are hanging off or anything like that. Looking above and below, I'll usually grab the vertical stabilizer and kind of give that a shake with my hands, make sure it's not loose or about to fall off or anything like that. I've heard of stories where people come out to pre-flight the airplane and they grab like the horizontal stabilizer here and like the thing was hanging off. So I always give grab it with both my hands and kind of give it a good good tug just to make sure it's attached, right? So we're looking for any obvious damage above and below, continuing our walk around. We're going to check the elevator. Okay, my flight controls are not working. Hold on a second. It might just not work in drone view. Yeah, they're working. I think just drone view, it doesn't register. So I'm going to move the elevator up and down with my hands. Looking down here in these hinges, looking for missing cotter pins or missing bolts or anything like that. And making sure that the elevator moves full range of motion up and down. Then I'm going to look at the vertical stabilizer, looking for any obvious damage. Again, looking at the rudder as well and looking in these areas at these hinges. No missing bolts, no missing pins. Come down here, make sure these, tab these cables are attached to the rudder, kind of move it back and forth real gently with my hands just to make sure they're attached. And same thing on this side. Elevator, looking for missing cotter pins and bolts, checking range of motion. Also looking for, looking at these static wicks and antennas and such, make sure none of those are broken around the front side of the stabilizer and doing the same thing on the other side here, just looking for obvious damage. Nothing funky going on there. Looking at the top of the airplane, the back windshields, nothing going there. Flaps. I'm going to grab it with my hands gently and kind of make sure to see if there's a little bit of play. There should be a little bit of play, maybe a an eighth of an inch, quarter inch of movement. I'll come down here and also look at the hinges as well. Again, no missing bolts, no missing cotter pins. Nothing missing from there. Then we'll move out outward to the aileron. I wish I could move the ailerons with the stick right now, but it's not letting me. You'd move it, check check the flight controls and make sure they're moving with the ailerons, and then also looking for missing pins, missing bolts, making sure nothing's hanging off, everything's secure. Out here to the leading edge and tip, just looking at the lights, looking at the general condition, leading edge and underneath, everything looks good this way. Our strut, I'll take a look at my strut, make sure that's firmly attached to the wing and the fuselage. And then... Um, I'll jump over here to the main gear. My airplane tomorrow does not have these wheel pants, wheel boots, whatever you want to call them, so I'm able to look at the tire. I'm inspecting for any obvious damage. Tire wear, I'm looking for leaky brake lines and stuff like that. Again, just anything obvious, any fluids leaking, anything like that. Main gear strut, I'll kind of look at that as well. Look underneath, make sure nothing's crazy damaged. And I'll drain the fuel sumps from this point. So under the wing, there's going to be these little uh, holes where you can take your your gas tester. You poke it up in the hole, it'll drain fuel. You're looking for color, blue, for 100 low lead, which is the type of fuel that's supposed to be loaded in this airplane. Um, if you see any other color besides blue, that's bad. All right, you would not fly. You'd go let your school know or the club know, hey, somebody loaded something funky in our gas tanks but it's not 100 low lead. You're also looking for water droplets and debris at the bottom of those gas testers. Uh, I was looking to see if I have mine in handy, but I don't. It's in my flight bag, um, so we're draining fuel from the sump there. I think this airplane here in the sim, the Sierra and Romeo, they have like five or six sumps on each side. My airplane only has one on each side, so I'm draining that one, checking. And then after I check, I'm gonna jump up top here Open up the fuel tank, visually inspect that it is full and topped off. You can see with your own eyes that it's topped off. I'll pour back that fuel that I drained. If it's not contaminated, I'll pour it back in here since we're not allowed to dump it on the ramp like we used to many years ago. You can get fined for doing that. So checking for fuel, making sure it's topped off. I'll also take a glance over the top of my wing, looking for damage again. Top over here, looking at these antennas and such, looking for damage. Jumping back down. Looking at the windshield and working my way this way. Uh-oh, I just reset the view. 
looking at the windshield, no obvious damage, everything looks good, it's clean. A lot of times they're dirty, you might have to wipe off some dew or some bugs or something like that. Make sure your windshield's clean before going flying. On a clear day it might not affect you as much, but if you run into rain or something like that, then you're really going to have a bad time. Um, next we're going to do is we're going to open up the oil door here, if I can show you guys this little thing here. You open this up, you can check the oil level, which is something you have to do. You'll pull out the dipstick, you'll make sure there's between whatever the POH says. For my airplane, I think it's between 5 and 7 quarts. Um, if it's low, you need to add some oil. If it's too high... Generally, it might not be a, a super big issue if it's a little bit over 7 quarts. Um, a lot of the extra stuff actually drains out a lot of the times. So it'll just it'll fall out the bottom. But you definitely don't want to be low in oil. So you could run into heating or something down the road and could end up in an engine failure. So oil level is important, making sure that that's at the right level. You want to make sure. Uh, also what's in there is the fuel strain. So there's a little thing that you can pull in there that's going to drain fuel from the bottom down here. I don't know if this airplane has one or where it would be, but mine has a little tube here. You would pull the strainer, taking my my gas tester again, putting it down there, catching the fuel, making sure that it's blue, making sure that it's not contaminated with water or debris. And if it's not, I can dump it back into the left tank once we check that. So oil checked, doors closed, oil cap is closed and tight, all that's good. Uh, we, we strain the gas from underneath, all that's good. And we're going to continue looking down here at the nose gear as well as the strut. Making sure there's a couple inches here. This is a hydraulic system. You want to make sure that this part here is not touching here, that there is actually some air in there or fluid or whatever it is they use. So there is some kind of springy action there. And uh, yeah, then moving over to the front. We're going to be looking at our propeller, we're making sure there's no obvious damage, no big nicks, no big chips taking out of it, just running our finger along the leading edges of both sides, looking at the spinner, no obvious damage. We'll look inside the cowling here, making sure there's no bird's nest, no animals hiding in there. Um, there's also the the belt, um, I guess, what would you call it, a drive shaft belt? There's a belt in there that attaches the motor to the propeller. That's what spins the propeller. You want to make sure that's nice and firm and attached in there as well. No obvious damage. Down below, making sure the air filter is clear. Making sure our exhaust is attached. Again, I'll take a glance at the nose wheel and make sure there's nothing weird going on there. Other side of the nose gear, same thing. Looking for a couple inches there on the strut. Looking at the wheel, making sure tire pressure is good. Nothing's leaking or anything like that. And then we're going to want to look at our static port, which is located right here. So this little hole here is what pulls the, what gives us the static pressure from the outside that uh, gives us our altitude and airspeed information. That as well as the pitot tube up here in the wing, which we'll, we'll look at once we get there. So making sure the static port is clear. If that's clear, we can jump up top here, looking at the other side of the windshield fine. And then we're going to check the other tank for fuel. Um, actually, you know what, before I do that, I'm going to skip a step, few steps and come down here and dr drain the other sump. That way I don't have to open up the gas tank twice. So I'm draining this left sump now, checking the fuel, making sure it's blue, making sure it's not contaminated. And now I'm going to jump up here, open up the gas cap, visually inspect that it's topped off, everything looks good. I'm going to pour that fuel that I just tested that's clean back into the tank and close the tank. And then check the other side, wing, top, everything looks good. Jumping back down, now we're going to check the wing and wing strut. So going out this way, I'll check the strut first, just making sure that's firmly attached to the fuselage and the, and the wing. And then we'll come back into the inner portion of the wing here. Um, these are just air vents. Um, I don't know if this one here... Okay, this I think this is the stall horn over here. These are just air vents, I believe. Um, nothing really to look for there. I mean, you could look inside and make sure there's nothing hiding in there. Running my hands along the leading edge, looking for damage. Our pedo tube, we want to make sure that's clear. That's what supplies us with our airspeed information. So you want to make sure that's clear. Continuing on. My airplane will have a fuel, fuel drain 
pipe here too as well. You want to make sure that's clear and unobstructed. Checking the stall horn as well, making sure that's clear. And then just continuing out, just looking at the wing, top and the front. No obvious damage. Outer edge, lights, tip, no damage. Now we're going to check the aileron here on this side as well. We're going to check for range of motion. And we're going to check for missing bolts and cotter pins on the hinges. And then work our way inward to the flaps again. Again, checking bolts, cotter pins, and such. I'm going to grab it with my two fingers, very gi gently see if there's a little bit of play. Should be a little bit of play in the flaps, maybe an eighth an inch or so. All that checks out. We already checked the fuel. Let's jump down here and look at this tire. Sorry for the jumpy views, guys. <laughs> Drone cam's a bitch. Um, I could slow it down, but that's just going to take too much time. Um, wheel looks good. No leaks. Nothing going on. And we are done with our pre-flight. Before I jump in the airplane, I'll take a step back and make sure I removed all of the tie-downs and all the covers and stuff. Don't want to make that embarrassing mistake of starting the airplane, trying to taxi out, and then your plane is still tied down. All right, guys, let's freaking go flying, because this is taking forever. Jumping back in the airplane. Um, I already went through everything on the pre-flight. But if you really wanted to be extra safe, you could run through all this information here again. But we're not going to do that. This is all the stuff we just went over as we walked around. So now we're in the airplane, we've plugged in our headsets, we've got our seats adjusted and everything closed, we're ready to go. So before start, pre-flight inspection complete, passenger briefing. If I had passengers, I'd brief them on seat belts, which is mandatory. Seatbelts should be on for taxi takeoff and landing. In my airplane, I prefer that you have them on at all times. If you do need to take them off for any reason, let me know and I'll let you know if it's safe to do so. Um, doors, there's two in this aircraft, left and right. Uh, to open the doors, you'll pull up on the latch and then push out. To close the reverse, you'll close the door, close the latch, and lock. Two windows, left and right. To open and close the windows, you'll turn this little latch upwards, push out, reverse to close it. Um, fire extinguisher, there is one in my airplane located between the two front seats. To use it, pull up on the, uh, release the latches, pull the pin, and you have about eight, eight to ten seconds of use or so. If we happen to have a fire inside the cabin or maybe during engine start or something like that. Um, let's see, I actually have a passenger brief checklist here. All right, also supposed to say that I am the PIC, I'm the pilot in the command. My name's Tommy, welcome aboard, yada yada. So we went over seat belts, air vents. Okay, we've got air vents located throughout the cabin. It's these guys here. Um, so if you turn them counterclockwise, it'll open. If you turn them, no wait, yeah. Counterclockwise will open. If you turn them clockwise, they'll close, and you they have a little bit of motion. You can point them wherever you want. Uh, fire extinguisher we went over. Doors we went over. Um, traffic and talking. If you see any airplanes outside that look to be converging on our flight path, please let me know. I really appreciate it. Um, no talking during takeoff and landing unless it's necessary. Um, and that is it. If you have any questions, let me know. Back to our checklist. All right, passengers have been briefed, seatbelts, harnesses, secured lock, fuel selector valve is on both. Avionics is off, brakes, I'm on the brakes, uh, and circuit breakers. We'll check to make sure those are all in. All right, starting engine. All right, it's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to go through the... Um, yeah, you guys can see the checklist there on your screen, but for this airplane, it's a little bit different. So I'm just going to go through the procedures to start the 172 Sierra or Papa. All right, so we're going to get our beacon light on. And, um, bum, 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 bum. We're going to turn on the master, both switches. And then we're going to prime. So in the 172 November Papa, I have a little primer knob here. I would give it two or three pumps here on a hot day in Miami if it was a cold start, which tomorrow nobody's going to be using the airplane before me at 8 a.m., so I would give it two or three pumps of prime. Um, mixture full rich in that airplane. This airplane, we're going to go full rich for now. We're going to run the fuel pump 
for a couple seconds till we see fuel flow and then turn it off. That should move up a little bit and then turn that off. And then we're going to bring the mixture back to idle. Master switch is on, beacon lights on, propeller uh, throttles cracked, and propeller area clear. Clear prop. We're going to check all around, make sure nobody's around us. And let's go to start. As soon as it fires, I'm going to enrich the mixture all the way full forward. Mixture full rich, oil pressure, looking for the rise, looking for it to go in the green and throttle to about a thousand RPM. Between a thousand, yeah, about a thousand RPM to warm up. Oil pressure is moving, going up into the green. Avionics can come on. I'm also going to get on my nav light. In my airplane tomorrow, the ADSB is actually coupled with the nav light, so you always want to be running with the nav light switch on for ADSB, which is required in my area since I am in the Mode C Vale for Miami International Airport. Avionics are coming on, mixture is getting leaned, and flaps are coming up. Alright, avionics, lights, mixture, lean, flaps, up, transponder, we're squawking VFR1200 and on standby, and now we'll pick up the ATIS. Oops. Which I don't think we're going to have an ATIS. Let's see if we can pick up Miami International's ATIS, since Miami Ground is online on VATSIM. We'll just use that weather. 119.15. I don't know if we'll get it or not. But let's try. Half the time we don't get it anyways. An ATIS here at Tamiami would be 12400. I'm just going to plug it in just so I can practice for tomorrow. So 12400. Boom. Tuned. And I'll just read you the METAR again. We'll pretend like it's the ATIS. Let's call it uh, Miami Executive Information Alpha 0053 Zulu. Wind 070 at 8. 10 statue mile visibility. Sky clear. Temp 24. Dew point 16. Altimeter 3007. That's it. We picked up the ATIS. We've jotted down the information. We want to set our altimeter to 3007. Each one of the tick marks would be two, so seven's going to be about right there. Winds are zero seven zero at eight. Just write that down. All right, we've got the ATIS. We've got information alpha. We're going to go over to ground one two one point seven. What do the static wicks do? Ask Don T. Static wicks, uh, I think that's for like light, lightning strikes and stuff like that, or to discharge some electrical current that might be around the airplane. Um, yeah, that's kind of the general idea. It has something to do with the static around the airplane moving through the air. So it, it discharges the airplane constantly, so there's not like a whole bunch of electricity flowing around the airplane that'll mess with avionics and stuff like that. That's how I understand it. Alright, we're on 121.7. We're going to go to our taxi checklist. Which is really just a brake check. And then checking our instruments and stuff. I've added a few things to my personal checklist. But usually it's just lights. I mean, uh, brakes and instruments. 
So we're going to go over and pull up. We're in the uh, non-movement area. We can move here without talking air traffic control. We're going to pull over to the spot over by the taxiway there at the line. So let's release the brakes. We'll get our taxi light on. And we're going to do a quick brake check. Let's make sure we're clear all around. Left, right, behind us. We're clear. And let's test the brakes. All right, brakes are working. We're gonna taxi out to the right. We're clear out left. We're clear out right. Don says, if it was low on oil, I'd be asking why before I added more. It's normal for a little bit of oil to uh, to get burned up, especially if it's a an airplane at a flight school that's flying hours on end. I mean, these airplanes, I know my airplanes specifically, some of these kids fly these things for 16 hours a day at my flight school. I don't know how they do it, but these planes are flying all day long. So it's not abnormal to have to add oil. If it was my own airplane and it had been sitting there, then I would definitely be questioning why. All right, so I'm also checking my turn instruments on my way out of here. So going to the right, making sure my turn coordinator is working, the ball and the inclinometer is moving, and our gyro is spinning. We'll do that right now on our right turn out this way, and then once we make our left turn onto the taxiway, we'll check our left side left turns. All right, so we'll pull right here. We'll make sure we're right on the right frequency, 121.7 for Tamiami ground. You'll hear me refer to Miami Executive ta as Tamiami. That's what it used to be called, and a lot of us do, uh, do still call it that. So you'll hear Tamiami. <coughs> so my call would sound something like this. Uh, let me make sure I'm not on anybody's frequency on VATSIM. All right, so it's gonna be, t um, maybe I'll do a cold call too if it's in the morning, I haven't heard anything on frequency, I might say, Tammy and me ground, November 172 Lima November. They'll get back to me, 172 Lima November, go ahead. November 172 Lima November, Cessna Skyhawk spot four with information alpha, east departure, requesting VFR flight falling to Marathon 2500. They'll get back to me in November 172, Lima, November, departure frequency 121.5, squawk 5555. 5, 5. And advise, ready to taxi. Departure 125.5, squawk 5555, 5, 5, and we are ready to taxi November 172, Lima, November. November 172, Lima, November, taxi to Niner left via Alpha. Niner left via Alpha, Skyhawk 172, Lima, November. All right, so we're good. Punch in the squawk down here, 5555. Five, five, five. We'll plug in our frequencies later. This taxiway right here is uh, taxiway alpha. We're going to be making a left on alpha. We're clear out right. We're clear left. No problem, Don, anytime. I used to wonder what those little things sticking off the back of the airplane were all the time, too. Static wicks to discharge static from the airplane. Don T says, I'm going to take the TBM from Daytona Beach to Grand Bahama Freeport tonight. Nice, man. I uh, can't wait to learn the TBMs. I've been toying around a little bit with the 208 Caravan, uh, caravan trying to prepare for uh, Mr. Dean Eubanks' flight coming up maybe sometime next week. So I've been kind of like playing with that a little bit, getting used to starting the engine, stuff like that. All right, something to keep in mind when taxiing is the winds. Uh, winds right now are 070 at 8, so they're right behind us. You're going to want to add in some um, wind correction to make sure that the wind doesn't carry the airplane and tip it over. Generally, if it's it. If it's a direct tailwind like it is now, you're just going to push the elevator all the way forward. If we had a right quartering tailwind, we'd go elevator forward and full uh, left aileron. If the wind was from our back left, it'd be the opposite, full forward and full right. 
If we had a headwind, direct headwind, we wouldn't need any crosswind, uh, any wind correction with the stick. We just keep it neutral. If we did have a headwind from the right, we'd keep the elevator neutral, but we'd go aileron into the wind. If we had a wind coming from our left side, the opposite. Neutral elevator, left aileron. Since it's right behind us, we're going to just elevator full forward. And that'll keep the wind from getting underneath the elevator and nosing over the aircraft. At 8 knots, it's not going to make a difference, but if the winds were 20 to 30 knots or something like that, it could tip over the airplane, so... We're going to pull down to the end here and do a run-up. Do our before takeoff checklist. jump back to my taxi checklist. Uh, lights are on, brakes were tested, we tested our turn instruments, flight controls are adjusted for the wind, and our heading to compass. We want to make sure that this heading indicator matches our magnetic compass. Um, these uh, these gyros down here, they have, they, they go through what's called uh, gyro gyroscopic precession. So since it's like a spinning ball and another spinning thing, the friction between the two will cause it to wander off course. So sometimes you might take a look down at this thing down here and it might look like this. And you're looking up here at your magnetic compass, which is actually based on the, this is the Earth's magnetic poles basically is what this is. It's a magnet and it's picking up the, the Earth's magnetic from the poles, right? So this is true west. If you see something like this where it's totally off, you know that you've got to adjust your, your heading indicator. And that should be done every periodically every 15 to half hour or so because you will experience precession. Some airplanes more than others. It really depends on how old the instrument is. Some of them will do it very little and some of them will do it a lot. So let's turn around over here and face it into the wind for our run-up. Tamiami does have a designated run-up area on this side, but it's not modeled here in the sim, so we're just going to do it the old school way and pull up over here. Alright, now we're going to go back to our checklist. So we're going to do run-up. Alright, brakes, I'm on them. Cabin doors and windows are closed and locked. Flight controls. So I like to do I like to do the thumb method for the ailerons. So what I do is point my thumbs up like this on the yoke. So I'm going right turn. My thumbs are pointing that way. So that aileron should be up, and it is. That one should be down the other way. That one is up. That one's down. Elevator up. Elevator down. Rudder left. Rudder right. I'll also check my trim too. This one's kind of hard to do, but you pull the elevator all the way back, roll the trim up and just make sure that trim tab is working and then roll it back and set it for takeoff. Flight controls are free and correct. Flight instruments, uh, we'll check those and make sure they're all set. That's indicating zero, that's level, this has been set and indicating zero or whatever field elevation is. Uh, we check these, we check that and it's matching the compass. That's showing zero. All those are all set. Um, fuel selector valve on both. Elevator trim set for takeoff. Mixture is coming in full rich. And then we're going to run her up to 1700 RPM. So the throttle's coming in until we get about 1700 here on the tack. And then we're going to test the magnetos, which is the keys down here. You've got two independent magnetos. You've got a left and a right, and then you, you run them both on both when you're flying. So when we run one at a time, you should see a drop in RPM. So we're going to go left mag. There's a drop. In this airplane, I think it shouldn't be any more than, I think, 150 RPM. And then no bigger than a difference of 50 RPM between each mag. That's a good drop. Back to both. And then right mag, same thing. That's a good drop. Back to both. 
Um, in my airplane tomorrow, I'll pull the carburetor heat. You should also see a drop in RPM with the carb heat on, and the carb heat goes back in. It's here in my checklist. Engine instruments, we'll look over here to the left and make sure everything's in the green. Oil temp, oil press, our vacuum, we do have suction, and our ammeter. This is bugged out in FS2020. We're showing a negative charge, which it's not. Um, we are charging. You'll see here if I cycle the alternator, I turn the alternator off, and then it shows that we're charging. It's actually reverse, and you wouldn't see a huge indication like this. It'd be like just above the zero. Um, if we're discharging at this rate here, then uh, your battery is probably going to go dead at some point. Usually it's very slight when it's off, and when it's on, it's just above the zero, and you'd be able to cycle this to tell if the alternator is indeed working, which it is, but our gauge is broken. Okay. Um, that's it. We'll pull the power back to 1,000. Uh, let's do an idle check. Yeah, bring it all the way back out to idle before we go back to to a thousand. We just want to make sure that the engine doesn't quit at idle. She doesn't. She runs. So I'm gonna run her back up to a thousand while she continues to warm up. Friction lock. So you can turn this little knob here to adjust how much friction you want on the throttle. We have that set. Radios. We're on ground. We're gonna go to one one eight point nine, which is tower after this. Actually, usually after we're in the run-up area, we'll let ground know that our run-up is complete, and they'll hand us over to tower once they send us off over here to runway 9 left. So I'll say, Tim, maybe ground, uh, November 172, Lima November, run-up complete. November 172, Lima November, taxi to 9 or left via Alpha and monitor tower 118.9. 9 or left via Alpha and over to tower 2 Lima November. So we'll switch over, 118.9. At this airport, you would just monitor and wait um, at most airports and other class deltas, you would pull up to the line, and when you're ready, you'll let them know that you're ready. So we're on 118.9, radios are set. We'll also get our departure frequency in there, 125.5, since we'll be going to them after, since we did, we are getting flight following. So just to have it ready to switch over when tower hands us, hands us off, we've got it all set there. Radios are set. Departure review, all right, it's most likely going to be a straight out departure to the east. We're going to climb straight out going uh, up to 2,500, no higher, so we can stay underneath the Bravo. And we can expect to turn down to the southeast. And then let's go over the stuff that... the bad stuff. Uh, if we lose an engine on the runway, we'll pull the power back, we'll apply brakes, and we'll just stop and vacate the runway. If we lose an engine below 300 feet, we're going to land straight ahead either on the remaining runway or the grass just behind. Between 300 feet and 500 feet, we're going to go either 45 degrees or 90 degrees to the right. There's a nice patch of grass on the other side of Niner right that we'd be able to land on if we had to do that. Um, once we start getting higher than 300 feet on runway heading, we kind of run out of options straight ahead. If we go 90 degrees to the right, that'll buy us some time, and we've got a nice field over there. Not many options straight ahead to land at, or at least or that would be my choice versus going 90 degrees to the right, but it's nothing but congested buildings and cars and all kinds of stuff straight ahead. Basically no options, so. Between three and five, we're going 45 or 90 to the right and landing in the grass behind nine or right. Above 500, we're gonna make a left turn into the wind and go back for runway 27 right. Um, I know some people would call 500 feet impossible, the impossible turn. I mean, I've done it many times in training. I know that the prop is still spinning and I'm also aware that the my instructor is going to simulate an engine failure, so I already kind of know ahead of time. But 500 will at least get me back over the fence line here at Tamiami, and that's better than going straight ahead. So if I can make it across the other side of the fence, maybe I won't make it to the runway, but I'll make it into the airport property. I'm good. I have some grass I can land on. That's going to be the better way to go as opposed to going straight ahead. All right, so that's it. Let's pull up to the line. I'm going to face this way so I can see if there's any traffic coming in. 
but maybe tower did not see or anything like that and before we take off let me go glance over at okay uh we have miami approach now so let's go ahead and contact him before we take off let's go to one two four eight five that's good we'll get flight fall actual flight following with him at least for a portion of the flight one two four point eight five So normally I'd be departing out of here with tower. Once I get to like 500 feet, a thousand or so, they'd say, uh, to Lima November, contact departure, good day. And we'll say over to departure, to Lima November, and then we'll switch over to 125.5. In this case, we're gonna go straight to departure, which in this case is gonna be 12485. United 2201, Miami departure, clearance and request, standby. So let's go back to squawking VFR for now. We're going to get a squawk code from him in a moment here. Yeah, we also forgot to put this on mode C for heading out. That was another thing. Do I not have that on my checklist? Okay, I have it on my before takeoff, which is like kind of a last minute lineup thing. So, yeah, that's how usually I do it in my airplane that I train in. Number six, turn around and tango turn left, heading 240, vector for traffic. That looks like that there. So once, I, once I'm once i done left, with the run up, two, I pull up four, to the line. Two, Actually, I usually three, do this in the run up area as well. I'll just jump straight to this checklist. Checklist, go flaps up for takeoff, which they are. Car heat's cold, pedo heat not required. Lights are coming on. Time note, an abort plan ready. We discussed our abort plan and we'll be spring-loaded for that engine failure just in case it does happen to us, because it could. And now let's contact... Number 6, Departure. Off your one o'clock, five miles, opposite direction, type unknown, altitude indicate 6,000. Yes, sir. Traffic inside, <coughs> November 6909 or Tango. November 6909 Tango, thank you. Maintain visual separation with that traffic. Okay, maintain visual operation with the traffic. Number 6909. Miami approach, Jeff 1149 with you, 6000. Jeff 1149, Miami departure, squawk 3730. 3730, Jeff 1149. Miami approach, good evening, November 172, Lima, November. Got stepped on. That was block uh, 1108, say your call sign, just your call sign. Midex 1108. Midex 1108, Miami approach, expect the ILS runway niner, Miami altimeter 3008. Say the ILS for runway niner, thank you very much. Other craft calling Miami, go ahead. My approach, good evening, November 172, Lima, November. We're at Miami Executive holding short, nine or left. Uh, we just realized you got on. Um, we have the latest weather. It's going to be an east departure, and we're requesting VFR flight following to Marathon, 2500. Number 172, Lima, November, squawk 5251, and let me know when you're ready to go. Squawk 5251, and we'll let you know when we're ready. Skyhawk 172, Lima, November, thanks. All right, so to five honest, two. I started watching your stream when you streamed the uh, Lakeland thing, and I'm a huge fan. So props for that. Hey, awesome, man! Thanks, appreciate it. Number six nine zero nine or Tango. Clear hey, look at that! Six. We're famous. All right, five two five one on the squawk. Anybody at two zero eight radar contact? You have to leave. Departure's gonna be with him. Across the 3,000 uh, 3, 3, feet and climbing. And I think we're ready, right? Yeah, we We've done everything, all of our lights are on, we're squawking down. mode C, mixture's full, rich, flap set, we're all ready to go. Shallow and maintain 1, feet. Devil 1149, climb, maintain 1, 6, Oh, Miami Center's on too? Oh, awesome. So we're going to have VFR flight flying the entire way. Number 212, Papa Delta, cross Miami International Midfield. Two of those across the midfield, uh, Miami International. 
Cargo at 8, Sid 04, welcome to Miami Cross Runway. Uh, where are you parking, first of all? <laughs> Dante says, nice to be Cargo appreciated, eight, huh? Roger, Funny to be recognized, left. weird. On Tango. But good, good thing. Right with I'm glad. Left Sierra, actually, disregard. Left on Tango, joins I've Sierra talked to this guy many here. times. He's a Miami controller and Vat Sim. I've talked to him many times, either doing approach or center. And I do remember him from from the uh, from the event as well. He was doing the the arrivals there, tower arrivals into Lakeland. Six, nine, zero, nine, zero, Good guy. Approach November one seven two Lima November. We're ready to go nine or left to Miami Executive. Number one seven two Lima November. Uh, straight out departure on course approved runway nine or left for takeoff. Tammy Amy wind is zero seven zero eight. Straight out, on course approved, clear for takeoff, 9 or left to Lima November. Alright guys, we're ready to go. Uh, six, nine, zero, nine, zero, tango, did you confirm? Alright, I see 9 or left there on the ground and on the signs, we're clear out left high and low, and we're clear Number out six, nine, nine, right nine, down the runway. Yes, do you confirm the altimeter, please? Six, nine, zero, nine, tango, I just got the I like to use all the runway, three, zero, zero, even seven. if it's a long... Thank you. Long strip, I like to use pretty much every inch, since like I said, there's not many options straight ahead. Alright, C9 or zero. left, heels to the floor. Roger, Midex, uh, Full power. Winds a little bit from the left, so I'm going to put in a little bit of crosswind Roger, correction. You can monitor ground one, one Alright, power set. Engines are in the green. Airspeed's alive, we're going to be rotating at 55. There's 55, rotate. Positive rate, we'll tap on the brakes. We'll continue our climb out here, looking for VY in this airplane. VY is best rate of climb. And it's 70, I think it's 74 knots in the Romeo and the Sierra. In my airplane, the Papa in November, it's... Uh, 76 knots. So 74 VY, we're climbing out of here. Spring loaded for that engine failure. If we lose power at any moment, it's going to be right turn 90 degrees. We're about to pass 500. After this point, it'll be a left turn into the wind back to the runway. 500 feet, climb checklist, airspeed, power, mixture, lights, instruments are in the green. So we'll continue. Gonna go up to 2,500, and we've been cleared on course. Skyhawk 2, Lima November, radar contact, the altitude leaving. Leaving through 900, 2 Lima November. Skyhawk 2, Lima November, resume all navigation, remain clear of the Miami Bravo. Resume all nav and stay clear of the Bravo, November 172, Lima November. Still maintaining VY all the way up. Once we get to 1,500, we'll start that southeast turn. Bravo starts at 3,000 feet. So we're going to make sure that we don't bust that. We're going to stay at 2,500. Tango Tango 5, Bravo. United 27 North Mark. All right, we're clear out right. Let's go. Let's go right heading. Uh, let's do one two zero for now. Continuing up to two thousand five hundred. Fly out over the water, and then we'll be looking for the those islands that we talked about during our briefing. ABC 047, welcome, welcome. What do you use to plan your VFR flight plans? I use, a lot of times I'll use Garmin Pilot on my iPad, which is a paid app. If you want a free option, which is also really good, 
and PC based, uh, skyvector.com is a good one. And I went all I went over all the stuff uh, before we started flying today. If you want to go back and watch the replay later on, I went through a pretty in-depth uh, flight planning and briefing for this flight. Since I will be doing this flight in the real world tomorrow in an actual 172, so that's why I'm here doing this tonight. Just practicing and preparing for tomorrow. All right, 2,500. We're leveling. Uh, We've also got some uh, layer of clouds just above us, and we are VFR, so we can't really go any higher than this. We'll be going into the clouds there. We want to be at least 500 feet below. We're just going to keep it here at 2,500. Now that the airspeed speed up to around cruise speed, we're going to pull the power back to 2,300 RPM for cruise. And then we'll trim her up so we can go hands-free. Not going to use the autopilot. I don't have autopilot in my real airplane. And I don't like to use it here when flying the smaller stuff on the sim. Good to practice all manual. Let's get her trimmed up for 2,500. And I already have those islands in sight, so we're heading there for the northernmost tip. We'll head out this way, and then we're just going to follow this island chain all the way down to Marathon. So you do a cruise checklist, power between 22 and 2700 RPM or 23. Trim has been adjusted for cruise. Mixture uh, below 3,000, we won't. Generally, we won't lean the mixture. Um, if you want to pull it back just a hair, you could. I'm not super picky about that. Um, if I'm below 3,000, I'll just leave it full rich. Above 3,000, then I'll start leaning. So we're going to stay full rich at 2,500, and then heading the compass again, since these things do have what's called gyroscopic precession and get thrown off. We want to make sure that that matches the magnetic compass up here. All right, about to cross over the shoreline now. You can see downtown Miami out there. We've got downtown Miami and then South Beach out this way. Airy approach, Micro 501, level lane 16,000, information Juliet. Keeping an eye on that altitude, Correct making sure we're staying at 2,500. If we Miami, go higher than 3,000, we'll be busting into Miami's Class Bravo and get huge trouble city, uh, approach, since we do not approach. have clearance. 501, expect the ILS, runway 1 to approach. Into there. ILS 1 to approach, Micro 501. Minutes, uh, 11-0, it's going to be 3,000. So he's heading straight to the island over here. Let's see, can we see Chicken Key? Yeah, this is Chicken Key right here, which uh, we saw on the TAC chart during our briefing. That's a visual checkpoint there. The VFR pilots use in Miami, usually when going in or out of Tamiami, and flying out here over the water. That's Chicken Key. You'll see that there on the terminal area chart for Miami. Then we've got, we've got Homestead Air Force Base right here. Yeah, they have a class Delta. We're outside of it out here. But, yeah, you want to stay outside of that as well. Unless you're talking to the tower over there. What's going on, Gerardo? I was the approach controller. I love your stream. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Gerardo. I appreciate it, man. I've talked to you a few times on VATSIM. You do a great job as well controlling, and I appreciate it. All the work you do as well. You guys make this a lot more fun than it would be flying alone. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Gerardo. ABC047 says, do you have your PPL? Yes, I passed my check ride two months ago on February 27th, and I have not been up since. So it's been two months since I've flown, and I'm flying tomorrow morning, finally. Oh no, I think I just lost a sim. I did. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, it crashed. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, Alright, let's load back up.
That seems to happen to me a lot in the 172 in FS2020. I don't know why it happens in the 172 more than others. All right, let's get back on. No problem. We'll get some music going meanwhile. That's sim life. Gerardo, you didn't jinx it. Don't worry, man. <laughs> it happens to me a lot in the 172. I'm actually usually hesitant to load up the 172 in the simulator because I'd probably say more than half the time that I load the 172 in FS2020, the sim crashes. No big deal. If it was another airplane, I'd be kind of upset. But since it was the 172 and I'm kind of used to it, it is what it is. <laughs> we do have a problem with jinxing stuff in the chat here <laughs> on the stream. A lot of the things we talk about uh, that we usually jinx is performance issues, of course, again, like I guess this falls into that category as well with FS2020. It's either it's going to crash or you're going to get the dreaded stutters at some point and low FPS. And a lot of times we'll have a smooth flight and we'll start talking about these performance issues and then sure enough, our FPS goes from 60 down to like 3 or 5 per second. And it usually happens right after we talk about it, but... <laughs> it's not the it's not jinxing man it's fs2020 a sobo it's bad code a buggy simulator buggy software if we were flying p3d or uh x-plane we wouldn't have this issue there would be no jinxing <laughs> It's going to take a few minutes, guys, in the chat. If you want to go grab yourself a drink, go to the bathroom, now would be a good time to do it. It's going to take me a while to reset up here. We didn't get very far. We're just going to... I'm going to load up at 9 or left at Miami Executive offline. We'll depart out. We'll head out and do the same thing. Once we get out over the water there, we'll reconnect to VATSIM, refile. And... Um, and hopefully Gerardo sees us. <laughs> ABC047 says, unfortunately that's Flight Sim. Yes, especially this new one, man. It's, it's every other stream we have some kind of issue. All right, let's see, let's go back. TMB. Nine left, set departure. We've got the green light on there. Let me go in here and top us off again with fuel. And I'm alone, I weigh about a buck 50. Let's call it zero here, and then my bags are my co-pilot, maybe 15 pounds of bags. Here, we can drop this down just a hair for that startup and taxi. And that's it, flight conditions. I was, we were doing real world weather, but we were doing a morning flight to simulate my real flight tomorrow. Let's call it, let's call it 8.13. Let's see, maybe we have another crash somewhere along the way. Gerardo says, uh, you can connect on the runway and call me. I'll just give you your squawk again. There's nobody else at TNB. I'd rather you do that before you're in airborne conflict. Got you, Gerardo. We'll do that. Roger. Steven, uh, Steven Hayes says, oh, damn, LOL. You haven't migrated, you haven't gone to FS2020 yet, Steven. You you don't have these issues on X-Plane. At least I don't think you guys do. 
I haven't flown X-Plane personally. I came over from P3D, but hardly ever did we have any crash the desktops on P P3D. You'd have to really throw a lot at it for it to crash the desktop. Alright, mixture rig, flaps up for takeoff, trim is set, we're on both, lights are all on, we're all looking good there. Let's go back to Miami approach. YouTube Premium can help with that. Oh yeah, let's connect first. You can study back to back to back. V pilot. You can download videos so you can connect 172 Lima November C172. And you can We're squawking mode C. Let's refile it. Upgrade to YouTube Premium. Try one month free. Let's wait a second for it to load. Make sure everything registers. Alright, file. We'll wait a second for that to go through. While that goes through, we'll tune over to 124.85. There it is. Confirm. Yeah, Jimmy Charlie one thank you. Fly, maintain at 16,000, clear direct beach. Fly, maintain 16,000, and clear direct beach. Nice, nice to know. Miami approach, November 172, Lima November, we're back up, Niner left, Miami Executive. 172, Lima November, Miami, departure, squawk 5251. 5251 on the squawk, Skyhawk 2, Lima November. That's Skyhawk 2, Lima November, straight out departure, on course, approved, runway Niner left, clear for takeoff, Tammy Miami wind 070, Straight out departure, on course, approved, clear for takeoff, Niner left, Skyhawk 2, Lima November. All right, guys, let's go. Heels to the floor. Replay mode, FS2020. It's the replay. Oh, you know what? I forgot to load up the weather. Let's do that, too. A little sloppy there because the weather kicked me around. All right, rotate. We're just trying to get back to that point that we were at. Our altimeter. There we go. Set. Climbing out of here at 74. Straight out and on course approved. We'll do the same thing we did last time. We'll go runway heading to 1,500, then we'll make our Dragon southeast turn. Welcome back to the sky, guys. Welcome to the sky. That's a Ludix Aviation thing. I don't know if any of you guys follow Ludix Aviation on YouTube. He's a flight instructor based out of Orlando Exec. Alright, 500 feet, airspeed power, mixture, lights, instruments. Everything looks good. Continuing our climb, 1,500 runway heading. Uh, where are you parking? Hello, the bars in the queue. If you want to park me, we really appreciate uh, the event here, right? Hello, is there your date again? We don't know the where, the, where we have to park. It's insane how real this looks, we too. Yeah. For those of you who don't own the simulator, really like, you don't actually know until you see it. Like, this is literally what it looks like when I'm flying in real life. Like, I, I kid you not. Alright, there's fifteen hundred, let's start our right turn. We're we're clear out right. Let's go to let's go to one one zero and continue our climb up to two thousand five hundred. Skyhawk two Lima November Seven hundred two Lima November. Skyhawk two Lima November. Resume on navigation. Remain clear of the Miami Bravo. Resume on nav and remain clear of Miami's class Bravo. Skyhawk two Lima November. 
Alright, again, Bravo. Above us starts at 3,000. We're going up to 2,005. Staying there. ABC 047 says, gotta go. Good luck tomorrow. I'll definitely be back. Thanks, ABC 047. Welcome to the channel, man. Hope to see you next time. Take care, man. Have a good one. Stephen Hayes, people do get CTD with X Plane, but so far, thankfully, I haven't experienced that. Lucky you, Stephen. I think X Plane's pretty solid, though. At least it's not as much of a problem as FS 2020. All right, 100 feet to go. We're leveling 2,500. I've got the, the islands over there in sight. I'm just going to head straight that way. Actually, we'll, we'll do 120 for a little bit longer just to make sure we clear uh, Homestead Air Force Bases Class Delta. Make sure we stay well outside of that. So leveling now. 2,500. We're going to let our airspeed build up a little bit. 110 knots or so for cruise. And then we're going to pull the power back. 2,300 RPM. Downtown Miami. Seven three seven on a There's a Dade Land. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the area. This is the Falls area. She used to work right down here in this building. My house. You can probably almost see. So this. This is Palmetto Bay Park. I live about two minute drive from this park. So you go down here to this street. You go down this way. I can probably literally spot my house from here. This is 184th Street. Not quite as far as the canal. Okay, this is my street right here. My house is literally right there. United yeah, United I can actually Miami see my house from here. Hello, it's that one. Let's watch that altitude, alright. Make sure we don't bust that Bravo. Rogers, uh, possible for eight, right? Uh, 298. Um, you're parking on the south side, aren't you? Like, yeah, actually, it's not the south we are. Sure, that's what I thought. Yeah, we can take one there. We just need to switch it. Roger, no problem. Yeah, my house is right. All right, uh, here's the park. Here's the canal. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right in there. Homestead Air Force Base out that way. Watching that altitude. Planning approach. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it wasn't a scenery issue and crashes again in the same spot, says Stephen Hayes. I think it's more related to the airplane, to be honest. Something about this airplane, man. For me, it's like a 60 to 70% crash rate in the 172 in FS 2020. The other airplanes don't do it as much, but whenever I load up this airplane, man, more than half the times it will it will quit. It'll crash to desktop. There's Chicken Key again, like we discussed in our briefing. That little island there. Yeah, 298. We're gonna maintain one one thousand. All right, let's head straight this way. We're gonna head over to this island, then we're just gonna follow that all the way down to Marathon. American 9721, pilot discretion, listen to maintain 8,000. 
It's going to be fun after the flight tomorrow to go back and compare the simulator. I've done this flight in the simulator, so I know what it looks like. I mean, it's pretty on point. But once I get that video uploaded, uploaded on YouTube, uh, it would be cool to compare it side by side. Request data of discretion at the International Satellite 1550. Done, the interest of Roger. Right turn on Tango, hold short 1 2, this frequency. Tango 1 2, this frequency 1750. This plug in marathon down here is a reference. Marathon Florida, enter, activate. There you go. You can see we're well outside of uh, Homestead Air Force Base's class Delta. We're gonna head out over this way. And then we're just going to follow this down. Alright, we're clear out right. Alright, we're clear out right. And Juliet, Jet Moon, Hudson. And Jet Moon 52, information Kilo came turn like about 10 minutes ago. Alright, so we'll uh, grab Kilo. Alright, Jet Moon 52. We have a 298-78-8000. Number 279 of Bravo Tango transition to Cornwall Hill International Airport North 2000. Yes, Steve Canevo. Canevo, I don't know how to say it, Mr. Stephen Hayes. Uh, yep, he's based out of Opalaka, which is maybe 15, 20 miles north of here. So just north of Miami International, a couple miles is Opalaka. Executive. In that altitude, I've flown in and out of uh, Opalaka many times. That's where Stevo is based out of. I know he flies the TBM. He used to fly the CT-08, the caravan. Yeah, he does a lot of flying down here in the Bahamas. I think he's like the OG of like uh, of um, aviation vlogging. Like he was like the first to do it. Everybody else followed after. Press one two and the other side one seven five for every five zero one. Sorry about that. Sorry. Kepler fifty two maintain three zero zero knots for greater. Three zero zero greater Kepler fifty two. American ninety seven twenty one to seven maintain six thousand. Seven maintain six thousand. American ninety seven twenty one. American ninety seven twenty one. Fly heading two seven zero back to the final first course. I saw the video he posted, Steve-O posted pretty recently of uh, flying the brand new TBM 9 something. Brand spanking new. That was pretty cool. Of course, I'd be happy with any TBM. <laughs> Don's back in the chat. Welcome back, Don. So we had to crash the desktop shortly after departure, so we had to reload the simulator. And we're back at it again, round two. We're not too far out over the coast. We're just joining up with the islands now off the east coast of Miami and starting to head down now to the south on our way to Marathon. 
don't know where it was you left, but uh, Miami Approach is online and we are on flight following. American 63. Uh, oh, uh, Miami it looks like Miami Center is online as well, approach. so we should have flight following all the way down to Marathon. Miami approach. So good practice for me for tomorrow. Nine. These are probably the most neglected instruments over here in our left American side, and those happen to be yeah. the most important ones that you kind of want to look through your uh, scan every once in a while. Checking right, in, sorry, keeping an eye on that fuel, my call making sure we don't run out of fuel, no, oil temp, oil press, I making sure that stuff is in the green, nothing funky going on, no needles jumping. Number 239, Bravo Tango, clear, this is the Miami class, Bravo airspace, out of low 2500. Suction's in the green. Alright, clear to the Miami class, Bravo airspace, uh, out of below 2500, Bravo Tango. Yeah, that's 298, to maintain 4000. 4000, 298. Right, we're coming up on Ocean Reef uh, Country Club. They've got a private strip there. We're just going to overfly at 2,500. We're well above what would be their pattern altitude if they if they had a pattern there. I don't think you would ever see any airplanes doing touch and goes at at Ocean Reef. I'm pretty sure it's. It's prohibited for noise abatement. It's really, it's really just a bunch of uh, wealthy people that live there on that island. So it's usually jet traffic going in and out of there to wherever it is around the world that they're going to. this time is with you. Maintain two five zero knots or left. Uh, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Captain Moonbeam on on uh, YouTube. Captain Moonbeam, he flies Citations and Caravans for his company, and he's flown in and out of Ocean Reef a few times in the Citation. I do see the field up there. That's Ocean Reef. So we keep it out over the water so we can see a view as we pass by. We can look out our window and look down. Do you know what a Delta airspace is? Oh, yes, I do. Okay, so it remains outside of the North Ferry Delta and the Opalaka Delta. There's a Delta airspace right there on your path. Alright, uh, sorry to make up for that. I'm about there. United 298, turn left, 180 there. 180, 298. Alright, good night, 21, it's five, five and a half miles from the bridge, turn right, it's still, this is the zero, we can take the lead out, just down to the low, I just let out, let's turn over. Correct, two, two, clear out in, four way nine, I think it's going to be nine, I think it's going to be nine. Yeah, for 15, you pause, it's going to be nine, eight, down. Thank you. United 298 is 7 miles from Payana, turn left heading 0, 9 or 0, maintain 3,000. I'm pretty sure that we are clear of Miami's class Bravo now. If we really wanted to, we can go higher, but we're going we're gonna to stay at 2,500 for this trip so we can get pretty views of the keys. Grid. Two not on two grid, American 9 or 7 2 Miami Approach, American 150 with you, level 16,000. American 150, Miami Approach, quick, yeah, let's 1-2 information. Kilo is current, ultimate at 3 zero, right? Uh, I didn't catch the first part of that. Can you repeat one more time for us, American 150? American 115, and quick, yeah, let's wrong way, 1-2 approach. Miami ultimate at 3 zero, zero, eight, information, Kilo is current in Miami. Right now, we're going to be expecting uh, one, two, thanks, Max, one, two, three. 
There's Ocean Reef yeah, Country Club ABC down there. We're slowing to 150, Roger, that's fine. Southwest 76. Uh, They've got the golf course as well. Have the final tip, climate departure, fly heading 090, runway 8, right, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, fly heading 090, Southwest 76. We could put in 1227, which is the sea tap at Ocean Reef. We could monitor that just to see if we hear any airplanes landing or departing out of Ocean Reef. So we could monitor COM 2. Of course, run VATSIM, the sea tap for advisory frequency is 122.8, so you're not going to hear anybody here on 122.7. But just to simulate for tomorrow's flight. I'll most likely be tuning in. Uh, 135.1 point what for uh, 2 Lima November? Two Lima November. Have a good one. Don says MF. Uh, MS2020 looks so lifelike. Yes, it does, man. I kid you not. Hopefully we can kind of get the same views out the windshield tomorrow in my flight so we can kind of compare, but I'm telling you it's like, I would say 95% accurate for flying VFR. Really good. Alright, 135, 175. Passing 3,000, plus Five one seven five. Climbing ten seven thousand. Traffic off your eleven o'clock five miles opposite direction of Diamond. Good night. Thanks, sir. Have a good night. Two lines. Southwest twenty nine one. Runway one left. Take off. Go. Ready two four two. Fly heading one two zero. Runway right. Oh, take off. What's um? Delta one eighteen. ILS twenty one left. Oh, that's that's kind of bugged. ILS runway uh, one left. Miami Center, good evening, Skyhawk 172, Lima November 2500. Good morning, 172, Lima November, Miami Center, Roger. Alright, so he's got us. American 3221, cross jingle at 8000. Yeah, no, Don, it's it's rate. almost exact, man, to be honest. Whether I fly in the sim or fly in real life, I'm always so surprised and like in awe at how real it looks. Like, I'll, I'll fly in real life, get home, fly in the sim, and I'm like, dude, this is, like, exact. Uh-oh, Gerardo says, never heard your readback, check your PTT. It's it's probably because we were monitoring COM2 here in FS2020 and probably bugged out the pilot. Thanks, Gerardo. Thanks for letting me know, man. We were monitoring two comms here. I know that sometimes doesn't go well with the pilot. Stephen Hayes says your VATSIM track looks interesting. LOL shows contact your contact return contact and contact second contact departure. Contact <laughs> Weird. I'm going to check that out in a second. Alright, continuing over the keys here. Uh, 
turn heading. Thanks for letting me know on that, Gerardo. Uh, center heard me, so um, I guess things are working now. Are, but I'm pretty yeah, sure it's because gold, heck, we were monitoring two comms, and yeah, there's some some kind of bug there between right, the sim and the pilot. Is. What's your call sign, sir? You told me everything about you except your call sign. Basic for minor. Okay, sir. Next time. All right, let me take a look at that track. Keep it short, keep it simple. On oh, that sim. SpaceX 19, Miami Center, Miami Center, Oh, you know what? The thing that I'm looking at, I'm looking at it through the website. Will it show me my previous track? Let's see. Oh, it does, okay. <laughs> I see it, Steven. That's freaking yeah, hilarious. So it showed me departing, and it yeah. showed where we crashed originally, or crashed the desktop. Then it looks like we flew direct back to Tamiami, which is, I guess it's, I guess it's kind of accurate, since we restarted there at the runway. <laughs> That's funny. already. Yeah, people keep stealing your code. I don't know why. Based off our Garmin over here, we're doing 120 knots over the ground. We still got 43 miles to go to Marathon. Estimated time and route is going to be about 21 minutes. All right, that's good that Gerardo told me about that comm issue. So, in the future, I won't mess with monitoring two comms here in Flight Sim 2020. Since that does cause problems. If he didn't let me know, then I would do it all the time and controllers would never hear me. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy that pays all, all the attention to streaming and doesn't isn't careful with the comms and making sure that that's all right. All right, we just crossed uh, well, a little while ago. We crossed the US one where it meets a uh, card sound. So this is US one now. This road leads all the way down to Key West. So here's where the highway joins up with the keys and goes down this way as we're just following this all the way down. So we're over Key Largo right now in the Florida Keys. Working our way down into Marathon. Yeah, I can pull up uh, Garmin Pilot, but I, it's not reading the information from the sim right now. So it's not going to show our little airplane moving along. It's showing me at home there, still sitting at my computer. That's where I'm simming from. <laughs> so we're actually, here's where the highway meets, where this orange dot is. So we're right about in this area here. We're by Rock Harbor-ish area, about to get into Tavernier. Back in 222, cross there in 8,000, Orlando, Tinder. So you can compare the map here on the, on the Garmin, 530. Just past this little, what looks like almost a, a bridge of islands that goes from the mainland down to the Keys. We're just south southwest of there, so it'd be about right here in the center of Garmin Pilot. So yeah, Rock Harbor would be this down below. This is Rock Harbor. Deco 100, what heading are you on? We are and we're approaching into uh, Tavernier. 
There's a couple private fields down there. Tavernier Air Park, a little grass strip there. There's actually a channel where you can get from the uh, from the west side of the Keys over to the east side. There's a channel that runs right there in front of the grass strip. I've done a lot of fishing in this area. And it used to be fun parking the boat right there in the channel at the end of the grass strip. Every now and then you'll see a Cessna take off from there, real low level over the channel. Childhood memories. Haven't been to the Keys in a while. It's a shame. I live so close. I haven't been there in many years. I've got to go one of these weekends. Eco 100, contact call 240. Launch and three, one of the MLB units on the free ports.com slash MLB. The one for zero J, contact, 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 I don't know if anybody in the chat here is uh, into fishing. Some of the best saltwater fishing takes place down here in the Florida Keys. Lots of fish down here. Whether, whether you're fishing the flats here, or fishing in the bay, or if you go out deep sea. Down here in this area, there's lots of, uh, in the bay, I mean, you can go to the flats over here on the west side of the Keys. Lots of bonefish, redfish. You can go up closer to the Everglades, the mangroves, lots of snook. Snook and redfish up there, you can go out, you can go out deep sea. Dolphin, sailfish. Marlin, you name it. You can go fishing the reefs and boat wrecks and stuff like that, catch a lot of snapper, grouper. Oh, sorry, I still have this in your way. show Tavernier on here. Yeah, it shows we just passed the Tavernier Air Park. Let's see if we can see it. It's this grass strip right here. So I used to do some fishing in this area. We'd go through this channel here. It's actually good fishing right in the channels as well, to be honest with you. We'd park our boat right here. Every now and then you'll see a Cessna take off from that grass strip there. And you're right off the, uh, right off the end of the runway. So this is Tavernier. And we'll be coming up on Holiday Isle in Isla Mirada. This is where I have a lot of childhood memories. This was our go-to key. My family and I used to go to. Number one for zero two, pop up, maintain two Several zero. weekends of the year, maybe two or three times a year, we drive down here to Isla Mirada for the day. They've got a nice beach there. Um, nice beach there, a couple bars right there in the beach. We'd leave my mom and my sister there, me and my dad would drive over to the bridge, do some bridge fishing, catch some snapper and stuff. As a quick scan over here on the left, we're doing okay on fuel, engine instruments are in the green, everything's looking healthy. Let's check our heading, make sure it matches our compass. Everything else indicates normal. Holy, is it 10.30 already? Man, I spent way too much time <laughs> briefing this flight earlier. Uh, runway 9 for departure, advisory, ready to taxi. Uh, ready to taxi, man. 
That, along with the, our, our crash the desktop, set us back a little bit, but I was not expecting to be streaming this long. We're just going to do the we're just going to do the single leg Miami exit to Marathon. We're not going to do the return trip here in the sim. I need to get to sleep, so I can wake up at 6 a.m. tomorrow. I have the airplane reserved at 8 a.m. from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. I like to get to the airport real early, so I'm in no rush. Nice thorough pre-flight, set up all my cameras and stuff. Be off off the ground by 8 8:15. I think I think this is the beach my family and I used to go to where they've got a few nice hotels there a couple bars there they've got a real nice beach Might be this one actually. So I'll have the moving airplane on Garmin Pilot. I can't really tell exactly where we're at. Let me see. Sava 706, Miami Center. Hard to tell. It's not that beach that I pointed out back there. It might be this one here. That looks Tampa a lot, a lot like it as well. All right, we're 23 miles out. Um, I would be picking up the ASOS in real life there at uh, Marathon, picking up the automated weather. That frequency would be on 135.525. Let's simulate it. So 135. So we don't interfere with V Pilot. We're not going to actually monitor it. 135.525. We're going to pretend like we push the COM2 button, and then the automated weather from Marathon will come in. Uh, automated weather observation, Marathon winds, yada yada yada. Yeah, I'll read you the METAR off Garmin Pilot. Winds 080, niner gusting 20. Wow, nine knots gusting 20. 080 right down the runway. They've got a runway 7, and the opposite end is runway 25. So we can expect to use runway 7 there at Marathon. Winds right down the runway 9, gusting 20. 10 statue mile visibility, sky clear. Temp 26, altimeter 18, altimeter 3004. Jesse Kyle Lloyd, what's going on? Welcome, welcome to the channel. I've been to South Beach four or five times in the 80s. Nice man. Yeah, I've lived down here my entire life, so I've been there many times. In the 80s, that's, that was probably the best time to visit South Beach. <laughs> uh, I was born in 86, so... I wasn't there in the 80s. Uh, maybe I was, when my dad would take me out to the beach when I was a kid. But I wasn't, like, cruising down ocean or anything. Um... Yeah, man, cool, Jesse. Welcome aboard. All right, so we've got we've got the weather. We'll just continue, and we'll be looking for the field. It's probably one of these islands up here somewhere. Once we've got it in sight, we'll let the center controller know, and he'll cancel our flight following, and then we'll join the pattern. We'll plan to join a left downwind for uh, runway seven. We'll just stay out to the west northwest of the airport. We'll join the 45 degree left downwind for runway 7 for a full stop there. Real life DC TAF frequency at Marathon is 122.975, but since this is VATSIM, we're going to use 122.8. So that's where we're going next after we cancel flight following. 
American One Raider contact 10 miles south of Nick Bix, welcome aboard. Echo 100, descend and maintain 12000, my mail is 3008. So did we already pass that other beach that I was mentioning? Okay, yeah, back there. I think this is actually Holiday Isle, Isla Mirada, one of the two. I think this is the beach where it used to hang when I was younger. Then we come and fish these bridges here. OG and uh, 16,000 for Pacific Airway 666. Check your text, sir. Rui 1747, radar contact, 10 north of Lorman's Beach, welcome aboard. Uh, roger, uh, Rui 1747, make a request, flight level 3. I'm ahead west just to stay a little, uh, a little bit north of the field so that we don't just inadvertently join the traffic pattern where we're not supposed to. We're going to do it by the book and enter the 45 for the downwind. There could be airplanes departing runway 7 going straight out as well. We don't want to be in their departure path. We've got some clouds here. Thirteen miles out. Let's start making our way down to a thousand, which is pattern altitude. The mixture is full rich. We can reduce power. And work our way down to a thousand feet for pattern altitude at Marathon. So 13 miles out, I think I see it. I think it's here. Wait till we're a little bit closer before we call it in sight. I'm pretty sure that that's it right there. Ecojet 100 to right heading 300. Alright, I'm gonna cancel flight following now, as soon as I get a chance. That way we have time to tune to the CTAF and let everybody at Marathon know what we're doing. Uh, clear Tampa, the, the Chisa Sea Chill departure, climbing maintain 4000, expect 6,100 minutes after squawk 4547, one by one Number 1106, Lima, Rebec correct, runway 6 for departure, advise and radio taxi short alpha. Uh, we are radio taxis, there's 16. 1106 Lima, runway 6 tax by Alpha, advise ready to departure and rhythm complete. Verify squawking 4547 prior to departure. Okay, runway 6 the Alpha, and uh, we'll set the squawk. Yes, Thank you. Miami Center, Skyhawk 172, Lima November has a marathon in sight. We'd like to cancel flight following. 172 Lima November, radar service train, fixing change crew, squawk and maintain VFR. Good night. Squawk and talk VFR. November 172, Lima November. Good night. Toodle. Alright, so we're going back to 1200, squawking VFR. And we can go over to the CTAF frequency 122.8. We're 8 miles to the north northeast. Let's make that call the marathon. 122.8. Marathon traffic, November 172, Lima November, White Cessna Skyhawk. Eight miles to the northeast, inbound to join the 45 left downwind for one way seven marathon. Still working our way down to a thousand. I do have the field in sight up there. It's right here.
right, sometimes I like to do my before landing checklist out here just to get ready. Sometimes I'll do it again once I repeat the numbers, but before landing checklist, seat back, seat belts, fuel selector both, mixture rich, lights are on. And in my airplane, uh, depending on where my power settings at, you'd want the carb heat on. Keeping it in the green arc, I'd keep carb heat off. No problem. Okay, we're coming up on a thousand, we're leveling off, so bringing back in the power, back up to around 2300 RPM. Leveling at a thousand. So there, there's the actual checklist there. See, but see. Seat belt, seat backs secured, fuel selector valve on both, mixture rich, carb heat on, autopilot off, lights on, air conditioning. Off. Oh, there I think we just lost the sim again. Alright, well we almost made it. That's it guys, I'm not gonna have time to reboot on this time. It's the 172 that crashes my sim all the time. We almost made it. It's alright, I would have greased that landing anyways. I guess that's it for tonight. Sorry about that, guys. That's FS2020 woes. Eight people in the, here in the chat and it's stuck around pretty much the entire time. Thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate your patience dealing with these crash to desktops. I know we didn't make it all the way. You guys want to see that landing. I do too, but I've really got to get to sleep. I really wasn't expecting the stream this late tonight. So no more restarting. Um... I don't know what else there is to say about that. <laughs> I really want to uh, you guys to see a landing there at Marathon. I did stream uh, uh, Miami Exec to Marathon Flight a while back, maybe a month or two ago, in the Beach Bonanza, and we made it all the way that time if you want to see it. If not, I'll be doing the flight in real life tomorrow, and you'll probably see that video probably sometime next week or so. Jesse Kyle, uh, Jesse Kyle Lloyd says, fun, thanks. I appreciate it, Jesse, man. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Good to have you aboard. Don says he just took off in my TBM. Enjoy the flight, Don. Have a good one, Don. Mr. Newbie. Oh, man, was looking forward to the landing. Oh, I know, Mr. Newbie. Hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, if I do, if I do turn the sim back on, what can we do? I mean, it's going to start me on the ground at Marathon. You guys don't want to see me run one circuit pattern at Marathon, do you? I feel bad for the people that love to see the landings, because I know that's like the grand finale, and that's what everybody likes to see. <laughs> like, if everybody went in the chat really wanted to, me to load back up the sim, I would do it. If you guys are okay with me leaving now, we can always do this flight again another day. Probably in another airplane so we don't have these crash to desktops. It's the C-172 in FS-2020, man. Every time. Almost every time. Mr. Newbie, I guess if anything, you can go back and watch any of my other streams. I'm sure there's a couple flights I've done in a 172 if you want to see a landing in, in there. Um, or there's the Bonanza flight into Marathon. Yeah. All right. No more wasting time, guys. I'm out of here. Have a good night. Have a good day. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you guys enjoyed what we were able to get through today. Um, a lot of it was focused on that briefing and planning ahead of time, which was good practice and review for me to set up for tomorrow. I will catch you guys. I don't know if I'll be streaming tomorrow for sure. Um, it's kind of a 50-50 thing, whether I'm not dead tired or not. Uh, late in the day yeah, definitely streaming on Thursday we do have an event here let me let's go through that real quick um, virtual flying USA virtual USA flying club on discord we're having a another one of our group flights tomorrow uh, Thursday night uh, April 29th 8, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time which would be 000 Zulu on the 30th so it's home field advantage, flight number four, from mountains to the sea. 
So we're flying out of uh, Lynchburg, LYH, and we're going to MFV, which is Accomack County Airfield. We'll be flying the smaller stuff VFR. That'll be on Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 2359 Zulu. So that'll be on Thursday night. So Thursday night for sure. Tomorrow, it's a 50-50 thing. If I do stream, I have no clue what time, either late afternoon or early evening. All right, guys, take it easy. Have a good one. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.